free and open source software in the surrounding community, looking at it from like a bird's eye view, seems like absolute chaos with nobody having any idea what they're doing. Something going wrong at least every couple of days. And today's case is an issue that sort of went undiscovered for a couple of years, with this blog author saying, this program is illegally packaged in 14 distributions, starting off by saying, I am not a lawyer. I as well am not a lawyer, but I do want to say that this is actually only an issue if the developer of the project decided to follow up with a lawsuit. People just using this code by itself isn't the issue. So today I wanted to package the T command line utility, which is a front end for the Gitia Gitforge. So Gitia is a project like GitHub and GitLab, but from my understanding, it's much, much easier to go and self-host it. So Gen 2's guidelines for Go helpfully states, since Go programs are statically linked, it is important that your eBuilds license setting includes the licenses of all statically linked dependencies. So please make sure it is accurate. And naturally, the dev was happy to oblige. Since you know, I go looking at the licenses for T's dependencies, and it turns out that one of those dependencies doesn't have a license at all. Now, I'm no expert, but this may violate the GNU free system distribution guidelines that distributions like Parabola strive to adhere to. So Parabola is a distro based on Arch that will only ship Libre code. And when something doesn't have a license, you can probably get away with using it for personal use, but you definitely shouldn't be distributing it. Also, it is definitely not free software. Now, Gen2 isn't the only distribution that was going to be packaging T. It's also packaged on places like, say, Alpine Linux, Alt Sisyphus, which I've literally never heard of, Arch Linux and a bunch of variants of Arch, along with the AUR, Chocolatey, Homebrew, Macports, Manjaro, Parabola, and a bunch of other places. And going through a couple of these packages, let's say this one on Alpine, this one on Arch, and also this one over on Nix packages. Generally, the license is listed as MIT. There are some other ones in that list that don't list the license, but at least for these ones, this is what is being said. And the reason why this is the one being said is because that's technically correct in the context of Gitia. So Gitia is, if we can go and find it, using an MIT license. And when a project doesn't have a license attached to it, this is inherently incompatible with MIT, BSD3 clause, GPL v3, or any other license out there, because you can't just go and apply a license to a code base that the developer didn't put a license on. That's just not how that works. And the author of this blog post describes this issue as a license to Duckin. Now, if you don't know what that is, it is the most American food ever created. It is when you take some chicken and then you stuff it into a duck and then you take that duck and you stuff it into a turkey. So in the context of this license here, it is when you take a software project that doesn't have a license or has an incompatible license and then you wrap it with another license and then you wrap it with another license and eventually you have this thing which looks like a turkey, it looks like a well-licensed project, but in reality, something is going wrong here. So the project in question seemed to be a project hosted on Gidea called unidiff-comments by no ERW. But in reality, this wasn't actually the cause. This was actually forked from a separate project by Seletsky called GoDiff. Now, 18 hours ago, this issue did get fixed. But for the past three years, there has been a single open issue. In fact, it is the only issue on the entire project. Clarify license created by no ERW. Hey, can you clarify under what license this code is provided? Thanks. And this sort of just sat around with nothing being done for a couple of years. Why didn't the dev respond? Well, very simply, he responded a bit later. Two years ago, the original issue was plainly lost in a never-ending stream of notifications. And you know what? Totally fair. For a repo which at that point he'd written four to five years earlier that had no open issues, that had no pull requests, and 24 commits, you probably weren't paying that much attention to what was being done with it. So why did NoERW go and fork the project? Well, two reasons. Reason number one 
is basically to add a couple of extra changes, like some test cases and things like that. But the main reason is to turn it into a Go module. But if we're being completely honest, he probably shouldn't have published the module without first clarifying the license. If that meant the module never got published, well, it meant the module never got published. But I doubt he ever thought that anyone would really care about this. Looking at it, it has two watches, two stars, and one fork. It's not like it was the biggest Go module out there, and I doubt he even knew if anyone was, you know, actually using it, let alone a tool that people actually use. However, there is some fault on the Go tooling. I've said it before in the context of GitHub, I'm gonna say it again here with Go, why does it let you make a public module that doesn't have a license attached? I get it if you're doing something internal within a company, or it's like a private module, but for something that other people, anybody out there can go and download, it needs to have a license attached. By not having a license attached, you are distributing code that doesn't have a license, which is not something that should be used in any other project. And since the release of this blog post, the issue kind of exploded and everybody suddenly found out. There was a bug report made over on Alpine Linux. There was a bug report made over on Arch Linux. Now in the Arch Linux context, it was assigned to George Rawlinson and once the issue got addressed upstream, he marked it as not a bug, which is not at all accurate because it was a bug. It had been fixed though. But me ranting about the Arch team doing really weird things is a whole nother video. A bug report was also made over on the T repo. Now, assuming the original author was an active GitHub user and this issue was just never going to be addressed, it's still not that big of a deal to deal with. So the project isn't that big, and it's only 29 commits in the modified version. Remaking this really wouldn't be that big of a deal. Yeah, it would take some time, but it's not like, you know, rewriting React, for example, or some other major core part of your project. And one of the developers of T did have a solution. He was going to work on a fairly basic PR that would temporarily resolve this while then working on a long-term solution that can actually properly replace it. So basically a temporary PR that will, you know, make it keep compiling, make everything keep working, and then bring back the same functionality as time goes on. However, as we saw, the dev did respond about 18 hours ago. So they had no idea anything was happening, but someone who knew them called Kovetsky said, hey guys, I know the author personally and asked him to add a license. And then Seletsky responded by saying, thanks. The license issue is a little exaggerated. I never imagined anyone would find use for that code, and two years ago, the original issue was plainly lost in a never-ending stream of notifications. By contacting me directly using my profile's email address, the problem could be easily resolved. Anyway, if it'll make anyone's life simpler, I've specified an MIT license. So all's well that ends well then. But it does raise the issue that sometimes distros don't list out licenses correctly. So there is a separate project called Restic. And if we look at the Debian copyright notice, it says this is using BSD2 clause, and then the fonts are under OFL-1.1. But then looking at Arch Linux, it only says BSD. It doesn't say BSD2 clause, 3 clause, or any other form of BSD, all of which are very different licenses. Doesn't mention OFL, it's just BSD and that's it. Now Debian is really, really good when it comes to listing out licenses. They have even gone so far as rejecting projects from their repo because the licenses aren't set up correctly. But a lot of distros like Arch don't really take licensing as seriously and just list whatever the top level license is, which is generally fine, but it is still technically wrong. The moral of the story here though, is don't just pull in random dependencies you have no idea about. Sure, it might be the best option out there and the others can't compare, but know what the license you're dealing with actually is, especially when you're dealing with a statically linked language. And if you can't confirm whether it may be incompatible with your license, then just don't use it. Now the last issue the author brings up is the same issue that T had, but this time with RipGrep, saying that encoding RS doesn't have a license associated with it, which 
seems to be completely incorrect and is a limitation with these auto license detection tools because the author of Rip Rep actually responded. Author of Rip Rep here, Burnt Sushi. Maybe, um, don't depend on auto detection tools as the ultimate source of whether something is appropriately licensed or not. Encoding RS is clearly licensed, otherwise I wouldn't have used it here in Rip Rep. We'll check that in just a moment. Take it up with the auto detection tools, or at least do your due diligence before claiming Rip Rep is using unlicensed code. The Debian copyright notice is correct for Rip Rep. So looking at encoding RS, it has three licenses. Apache 2.0, MIT, and BSD3 clause. There are a lot of projects packaged on Linux. There is almost certainly something else out there that has the exact same issue, but this isn't one of them. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Do you think this was that big of a deal, or did everybody sort of just over-exaggerate and freak out about this before it got fixed literally a day later. I would love to know your thoughts. And if you like this video, remember to go and like the video. If you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe, to the pay link in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over T. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robinson Plays. That's going to be it for me and I'm out.